Hi, thanks for listening to today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. We are in week number four of our Limitless series, and today we are hearing a message about rebuilding. Today's scripture comes from Nehemiah chapter three. The Life Notes are available now to download from calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here is Pastor Chad Garrison. I invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to Nehemiah chapter 3. The book of Nehemiah chapter 3 is our text today. And if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 469. Page 469, you will find Nehemiah chapter 3. You'll be able to follow along with us as we go through the text today. And as always, if you are in our room at any of our campuses, uh, if you need a Bible, you can take one. It is our gift to you. We want you to have God's Word, read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, just message us. We will be happy to get you a Bible, whether we hand deliver it or mail it to you, uh, because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God really will change your life. Hey, uh, I don't know if you guys have paid attention at all, but it's Super Bowl weekend. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, I'm wearing, a, you know, the jersey of my team. I know they're not playing in the Super Bowl, which just means they can't lose the Super Bowl. Uh, and uh, since, so you know, it's about the only weekend of the year that we're guaranteed not to lose. So uh, anyway, if, uh, but it's a Super Bowl. And if you don't know anything about Super Bowl, the, you know, the Chiefs and the 49ers are playing tomorrow for the championship. So uh, if you're a Chiefs fan, you think they're going to win, let me hear you. 49ers. Ah, Well, we are closer to California, I suppose. Wait, wait, there's one more. How many don't care? Don't care always wins. Uh, So, hey, one more thing in terms of a win. Let me just mention uh, one more thing. It's the season for it as well as uh, football, but, and that is tax credits. Hey, if you are paying Arizona State income tax, there is an opportunity for us uh, who are doing that to bless using part of our taxes that are, are you know, given to the state. And if you don't know about this, it's a great uh, you know, opportunity to bless in Jesus' name. So uh, can I just encourage you, if you're paying Arizona State income taxes, that you talk to your accountant or tax preparer uh, or grab one of the brochures that are available after the service uh, in our uh, out in the lobbies. Uh, f- two things. One is uh, ACSTO, which is to fund our, you know, CCA, or Calvary Christian Academy, our school. It helps to send students to school uh, so they don't have to pay tuition. And secondly is Faith and Grace. Faith and Grace is our domestic violence shelter that we partner with. And I would love for uh, you, if you got to pay, you know, income taxes, bless those, you know, ministries so that they can continue uh, serving people and and just doing what God's laid on their heart to do. So again, if you haven't thought about that, it is tax season. So make a note of that. Mention it to your uh, preparers. Or like I said, there's brochures out there. If you can't find them, come find me. I'll help you get those in your hands so that you can... uh, Look, it's just God giving us an opportunity, you know, our state giving us an opportunity. Let's not miss that opportunity to bless. Hey, uh, speaking of teams, have you ever been a part of a group project at work or school? Ever? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, just about everybody has, right? Um, How many of you enjoyed that experience? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, some have, some haven't. Not nearly as many hands went up. Uh, how many of you despise that experience? Ah, I see those hands. Okay. I mean, the frustrating part of every group project, every team, every committee, is that not everyone does their part, right? Right? I mean, it seems like there's always that person who's just kind of slacking off, doesn't care, and you are evaluated on somebody else's failure. Or... You do what most of us do, and that is you just do their work for them, right? Anyone with me? Yeah, you know, you're just like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to go down with them. So, you know, and all we ever want, you know, is that other person in the group who's not trying to try, just to make an effort, just complete what they committed to do. But not uh, all group projects uh, work, and some of them can challenge your ability to trust people, right? Right? question your thoughts about humanity. Uh, But on the other hand, when you're on a team, when you're working on a project, when you're with a group and everybody's pulling their weight, everybody's doing their part, and and you end up succeeding in what you're doing, isn't it a joy? 
I mean, it's just like, hey, this is great. And why don't we work like this all the time? This is fun. Some of you are like, that's true. But what does that have to do with the Bible? And more specifically, what does it have to do with our Limitless series? Well, we're continuing our story of this man called Nehemiah and, you know, just how God worked in his limitless power through Nehemiah. So if, you, if you're just joining us, a recap real quick. Chapter 1, Nehemiah finds out about Jerusalem. The walls are t- broken down. It's in disrepair. The people are despairing. And he gets this burden for the people of Jerusalem. He wants to rebuild the walls. He begins to fast and pray. And we challenge you with, hey, what's your burden of your heart that you want to you know, bring to God? And then the first part of chapter 2, he takes a risks. And he, because he's a cupbearer to the king, he asks the king if he can go and do this. And the king grants him permission and gives him protection, and gives him provision. So he gets to Jerusalem. And then the second half of chapter two, he assesses the situation. He looks at the walls. And and at the end of that, he challenges the people. He says, hey, we gotta do something about this, right? So in chapter two, we we just challenged you to, you know, take the risk of transparent living and asking for help, and to assess your life, and and go, where am I in my relationship with God? Where am I in, in life in general? So, Nehemiah finished the, the, assessing the situation. He went to the leaders and he said this in chapter two, verse 17. He said, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. Let us do this. So they strengthened their hand for the work. So then, at this point, everyone helped Nehemiah. Almost. Everyone helped Nehemiah almost. Okay? Chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. It says, Then Elishab, Elishab, I can't even say these names. There's going to be a bunch of these I'm just going to make up, okay? <laughs> then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hanael. And next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zachar, the son of Emery, built. The sons of Hassanah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, repaired. And next to them, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, the son of Mish- whatever, repaired. And next to them, Zadok, the son of uh, Baana, repaired. And next to them, the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. Okay, that's why I said everyone helped Nehemiah almost. By the way, chapter three, I'm not gonna read the whole thing because it drives you nuts, it drives me crazier, is just a history of who helped. That's what it is. It, and it lays it out, you know, 32 verses of names of people and they built from here to here and from here to here. And this part they repaired, and this part they repaired, and this part they repaired. And everybody did it except these nobles of the Tekoites. They thought, I don't know what they thought, they thought they were above manual labor, or maybe they just didn't like Nehemiah and they wouldn't follow his lead. Anyway, they went down in history. They are in the Bible as being unhelpful. (laughs) I mean, think about it. They didn't know. It's like, I just don't want to do that. And now, hey, you guys are the lazy ones, and everybody who reads this book knows it like billions of people. Congratulations. So, you know, everyone just jumped in and they helped. And, and, and I want to just make some observations from chapter three, which is just a list of people and, and, and help you apply some of this to your life. First of all, not everyone who helped was equally talented. Uh, in verse eight, uh, just jump down and find verse eight. Next to them, Uziel, the son of whatever, goldsmiths, that's the main thing, goldsmiths repaired. Next to them, Hananiah, one of the perfumers, repaired, and they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Last time I checked, goldsmiths and perfumers are not experts at masonry. So all these people jumped in, and they're literally, you know, doing masonry work, putting stones in the wall, rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem, you know, but they didn't have the talent. And and then in verse 12, it it says that this guy named Shalom and his daughters, you know, uh, I'm trying to turn the page, but I'm not going to read it anyway, that they helped build the wall. And think about that. This was, you know, 2,500 years ago, and and these women are going, hey, it's men's work. We're going to help anyway. It's kind of progressive at that time. He's like, I don't have sons. Come on, girls, let's go to work. 
I mean, they weren't all equally talented. That, that's just part of the story. But they jumped in and helped. And honestly, some jobs stink. There was one in particular. I love this verse. Verse 14, chapter 3. Malkija, the son of Rechab, ruler of the district of Beth Hakarim, repaired the dung gate. He rebuilt it and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. Hey, how do you think the dung gate got its name? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, this is like the toilet bowl of Jerusalem. And it's like, hey, let's take this all out and dump it out the dung gate. And this guy is like, I'll do it. I'll, I'll fix the dung gate. Malkijah is my hero. Okay, look, he, he seriously is my hero. He, I, I read this chapter the first time, and I go, this guy, this is the guy. I respect the people who take on the dirty jobs. See, look, I know that I'm in the spotlight. Okay, you guys are listening to me right now, and I appreciate that, uh, most of you anyway. And, uh, but, but here's the thing, I'm in the spotlight. Most of you are not in the spotlight. But all of us, what all of us do for the kingdom is equally important. It's not equally glamorous. It's not equally appealing. It's not equally noticeable, but it is equally significant. That, by the way, that's why I thank God for our maintenance and custodial staff. That's why I thank God for our chair team and our office and admin staff and volunteers. It's why I praise God for our children's workers and our student volunteers. I praise God for the hospitality team and the chaplains and the security and tech teams. And that doesn't even take into account the numerous individuals and ministry leaders serving in most ways that, that most of us never hear about. See, they aren't seen, but what they do is significant. And, and, and the reality is this. If Malkijah doesn't build the dung gate, the wall isn't finished and Jerusalem isn't secure. Some jobs stink, but they are all important to the kingdom of God. And I want you to see that they faced opposition. Uh, go back to chapter two just for a moment. I already turned the page. I have to turn it back now. Verse 19, this is after they said, yes, let us rise up and build. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Uh, I love Nehemiah's response. He goes, I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper and we are his servants will arise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. See, there were people profiting from Jerusalem's weakness and they opposed the rebuilding of the wall from the moment Nehemiah got there. They tried to slander them, in this case, accusing them of treason. Oh, you're going to do that? That's treasonous. The king's going to hear about this. Nehemiah's got papers from the king. He doesn't care. He knows the king personally. He's like, go ahead and threaten me with treason. Uh, they tried treachery. If you read on in the, in the book, uh, they tried to assassinate Nehemiah numerous times. They tried distraction. They tried to get Nehemiah to come away from the work and have meetings and, you know, it's like committee meetings and stuff. They tried threats. I mean, they threatened to attack the workers. They got together an army uh, of people and Nehemiah heard about it and he had the workers arm themselves. And then he had half the workers stand guard with their weapons ready while the other half were doing the work. I mean, it's that serious of a task. And, and so what's the point of that? If you are serious about pursuing this life-changing relationship with Jesus, if you're asking God to rebuild your life, you are going to face opposition. I mean, it's just a reality. It might come from friends or families. Uh, it might come from people that you used to party with, but it'll come. So just be on your guard. Somebody's going to say, what are you, a fanatic now? Oh, man, you think you're too holy to hang out with us? Are you just too good for us? Whatever the, the words are, the accusations. So everyone helped Nehemiah, except for some. And, and here's the really cool thing. They succeeded. They succeeded. Chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month Elul, in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. 
Okay, think about this. For 143 years, the wall of Jerusalem has been broken down, but with Nehemiah leading and everyone helping, they rebuilt the wall in 52 days. That's what success looks like. That's what the limitless power of God working through his people looks like. Isn't that cool? I mean, the Israelites rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem. And of course, you guys know this, but Calvary is building. We're building. I mean, hopefully you've heard about this. We've been talking about it for like a month. Uh, you know, we're gonna build a mezzanine balcony in here. Uh, we're gonna, you know, so we can expand to about a thousand seats. Uh, we're gonna uh, pay off our Parker campus remodel. It's almost rebuilt. Uh, it's taken longer than 52 days though, unfortunately. Um, we're gonna build a multi-purpose building with, you know, offices right out here uh, and, and, you know, have room to expand all of our, you know, weekday ministries and we're gonna, you know, pay off this building. I mean, that, that's, that's all the plans that we have. But can I just tell you, it, we're building so much more than just facilities. Calvary is building a ministry of life change. I, I mean, we've mentioned this, so I don't wanna beat it into the ground, but we've had uh, over a thousand baptisms in the last five years. And that's evidence that God is at work changing people's lives. That's why we exist as a church. So this is a place of life change. And we're also building a place of redemption and hope. A ministry, of, you know, just a place of redemption and hope. If you're broken, this is a ministry of healing. If you're afraid, we are people of courage. If you failed, we're a ministry of second chances. If you're despairing, we offer hope. See, Calvary is building a culture of grace and transparency and recovery where we know God can change your life and we know God can redeem whatever is broken. And here's the thing. We're asking everyone to help. And, and, and by the way, if you wanna be part of the building projects that we talked about, we've got dinners. They start this week, Thursday night, Friday night, Sunday, Monday. You can't come Tuesday. Sorry, it's sold out. But, but that, that's an opportunity for you to come and hear about it, for you to come and say, hey, I wanna be a part of this. Uh, we've already got almost 1,000 people signed up. We'd love to include you. We can't include everybody, but we'd love to include you. So if you've been thinking about coming, if you wanna hear more, if you wanna know more, then come on. We'd love to have you, but you just gotta sign up. You, know, you can do it online still. You can grab a Connect card and beg for help. We'll call you. You can call the church office. Uh, you know, but we'd love to have you. Now, some of you are asking, hey, if you want everyone involved in the building of Calvary, um, then what is our part? What is our part? I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> some of you are like, I wasn't thinking that at all. You can't read my mind. All right, look, I know you don't wanna be like those nobles of the Tekoites, right? Go down in infamy is like, everybody helped Nehemiah, but not these guys. Uh, so what's our part? Uh, Four answers, and can I just tell you that ideally, everyone does all of them, and, and then it, we you know, build the wall in 52 days. Uh, but rea rea in reality, everyone can do two of them. Most everyone can do the other two. So I'm just being honest. So what I'd like to do is just kind of share with you four you know, actions, if you will, four actions that is our part. And I'd love for you to have a conversation with the Holy Spirit about your part. What, what are you doing? Out of the four, how many are you involved in and what does God want you to do in those others? So here's the thing, our part, first of all, is pray. Pray. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, if you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and you believe that he was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you can take your request to God. He's gonna hear your prayers. You can have this conversation with God and intercede for people. You can pray for your family and friends to follow Jesus. And I hope you are. I hope that's part of your burden. You can pray for Calvary's leadership, that we wouldn't be stupid. You can pray for those who are sick and struggling and hurting and broken and ask for redemption in their life. See, we need people praying. And if you're a follower of Jesus, guess what you can do? You can pray. Everyone can pray. Now, if you're sitting there and you're saying, well, I don't really know how to pray, what do I, then just start. Just talk to God like you're talking to, to anyone else. He's listening. 
He knows what you're thinking. So go ahead and just, and just ask. Ask for what you want. Ask for what you need. Tell him what's hurting. Tell him what's broken. Uh, look, I appreciate the people who are interceding for Calvary. I appreciate the people who are praying for me. Thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, if you want to pray more, we have a prayer team. They're here at the conclusion of every service at every campus at Calvary. People who will pray with you, pray for you. Uh, if you have needs, then uh, they talk. And if you want to join the prayer team, come up and talk to them. We have a prayer ministry beyond that, that that prays during the week. If you would like to be a part of that, grab one of those prayer cards and say, count me in, I want to sign up, I want to pray. Um, so if you're alive and you follow Jesus, you can pray. Got that one? All of us can pray. And then, I believe, all of us can invite. Everyone can invite someone to attend Calvary. They can invite their family. They can invite their friends. They can invite their neighbors. They can invite their caregivers. Look, if you can't get out of the house, but people come and visit you and take care of you, guess what you can do? You can still invite them to come to Calvary. You can still invite them and say, hey, look, Jesus changed my life. He can change your life. I can tell you a place. I can tell you more about it. If you can't do anything else, you can do that. But you can invite. You can invite your waitress, your hairdresser, your nail, eyelash, facial tech, your doctors. You can invite the people. Look, if you're on somebody's table and they're working on you, they're a captive audience. <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm just telling you, there's all kinds of opportunities for you to have conversations with people. And unless you are living out in the mountains someplace like a Unabomber, you can invite people to come to Christ. You can invite people to come to church. If you're online, you're like, I watch online, I can't invite. Yes, you can. You can have people over to your house and you can put Calvary on and you guys can watch it together and talk about it. Or you can just simply share it with your friends on social media and say, hey, this is a, a church that I'm watching and God's speaking to me through them. You can come and, and hear too. All of us, I believe, can invite. If we're followers of Jesus, why wouldn't we? Uh, so here's the challenge. Because there's all, you know me, there's always a challenge. I, I, Easter is seven weeks away. I'm gonna challenge everybody to invite three, at least three unchurched friends to come with you between now and Easter. Doesn't have to come on Easter, but we're gonna add an extra service on Easter because uh, we know some of you will get them here on Easter. Hey, this is the season. They, they might come for Easter, they might come before then, but look, at least three. You guys up for it? Some of you are. Some of you are like, I ain't saying anything. I'm not raising my hand. <laughs> not doing any of that. Look, I know we're already getting crowded and we got to build because we're getting crowded. But here's the thing. The mission doesn't stop. The mission doesn't stop. So uh, all of us can invite. And by the way, let me just say this. The whole reason that Calvary has grown like crazy is because you invite. I'll just be honest. It's because you guys invite. Hey, we got people who don't go to this church that invite people to come here. Okay, I, I'm just serious. In this town, people go, hey, you know a good church? I, I, I don't go to church, but Calvary is. I'd go there. We're the favorite church that if people went to church, they would come here. <laughs> and I'm okay with that because they don't go to church yet. Right? But the day's gonna come. They're gonna walk through that door and God's gonna work a miracle in their life. So, uh, Let's invite. Let's just go ahead and speed up the, the we're out of space problem. Uh, and then third, the third thing is serve. Most people can serve. Now, some can't because of physical limitations. Some can't because of time demands on life. You're, you know, traveling all the time for business and things like that. Uh, but in this season, you can't. But most people can actively use their gifts and abilities to serve Jesus. Now, uh, I do happen to, to appreciate the army of retired people who now have the time to serve. They always talked about when, when I'm retired, and now you're serving, and you're blessing people in Jesus' name. So let me just say thank you. So, but what are the ways we can serve? We can serve, you know, regularly in ministry. The, the, I've already mentioned a bunch of them, but let me just mention some again. These are the ongoing regular ministries of Calvary. You could be a greeter. You could serve in our tech ministry. You could be a, a helping in children's ministry. You could help in students' ministry. You could be on the security team. You could help in children's ministry. You could be in worship arts up here singing and playing. You could help out with the hospitality ministry or the children's ministry or the chair team. You could be a chaplain or a deacon. Or Have I mentioned children's ministry? Look, if we want to reach young families, we need people to volunteer to be in, uh, helping out with children's ministry. So if you like kids, and I know a lot of you do because you have grandkids, 
And if you can pass a background check and, and you're willing to, to help out, you should go and talk to them. Uh, and then you can serve occasionally, like, you know, in special events that we do, like Night to Shine. By the way, thank you. It was so awesome to be here and watch this army of volunteers make the night incredibly special for the, the special needs community of Lake Havasu and the air, surrounding areas. It was a beautiful thing and a joy-filled thing and just a great way of saying we care because Jesus cares. Uh, so thank you. But we've got, you know, Night to Shine. We've got Limitless Dinners coming up. Did I mention those? I already did. Okay. Uh, but we've got, a, again, our hospitality team and our chair team and all these people that decorate and set up, they, they put all that work in. Uh, on April 20th, we're, we've got Serve Our Schools. Uh, we've got Teacher Appreciation coming up. We've got mission trips to Baja coming up in April and Zambia coming up in June. So most people can serve, and most people can give. Most people can serve, most people can give. And I know some of you are like, ah, rats, I knew he was going to end with that one. How many of you knew that was the last blank? Okay, what were the rest of you thinking? <laughs> like, we don't do the blanks. I thought that was a game everyone did where you filled in the blanks before I preached, and you, whoever got the most didn't have to buy dinner or something. Anyway, am I the only one who thinks that way? Um, I don't think so. Look, most people are able to support the ministry of the gospel and bless people in Jesus' name financially. Okay, most people. I say most because some cannot. Hey, if you have zero income, you know, you can't tithe. Well, you can tithe, but, ten, you know, what's 10% of zero? <laughs> oh, a lot of good people at math. 10% of zero is zero. If you make nothing, you don't have to give. I mean, that's just how that works. Uh, there's some, uh, some of you that are in a marriage with a non-believer, and, and you guys can't agree, and so you may not be able to share those resources because your, your home isn't uh, united in faith. But most people can give. And by the way, if you can give, can I just encourage you, uh, first and foremost, to practice tithing? Just practice tithing. Tithing is giving 10% of your income to God. And, you know, it's commanded in Scripture. It, you know, it's a big deal in the Old Testament, and Jesus affirmed it uh, in the New Testament. And uh, God asked us to do this for two reasons. Number one, to demonstrate that we trust God. It's just a statement, hey God, you're in control and I trust you. You give me everything, I give you back 10%. And secondly, it's his plan to fund ministry. And so when you give to Calvary's budget ministry, you are funding the entire ministry of life change that happens at Calvary. At all of our campuses and all the way through all the ministries, you are, you're helping to fund all of that. Now, some of you can give beyond the tithe to things such as the Limitless Campaign. And, and again, even in that, some of you can give a little bit. You go, I don't have much. Do you know that God looks at sacrifice and not amounts? There's a story in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, where Jesus sees a widow putting in just like two pennies into the offering, and he says, hey, she gave more than all these other people who are putting in a whole bunch of money. Because she gave out of her lack. She sacrificed. And, and so some of you are in that place where you don't have much. And you're like, I want to give. Then, then honor God. It, just honor God because he sees that and he celebrates that. And some of you are able to give a lot. Again, Jesus honors that and he celebrates that. He calls that a beautiful gift. In Matthew 26, there's a story of just before the crucifixion, Jesus is anointed by a woman with an expensive, like incredibly expensive jar of perfume. Like a jar of perfume that in today's money would be about $50,000 of value. And she poured it out on Jesus. And some of the disciples, especially Judas Iscariot, who was a thief, just went nuts. This money was wasted. It could have been sold and it could have been given to the poor. And Jesus said, stop bothering her. She has done a beautiful thing to me. And some of you, it's like, you know, you're like, I could, I could write a check. My family would think I'm wasting money. My family would go, what are you doing? And yet Jesus would say, hey, you're doing a beautiful thing to me and my ministry. But whatever you can give, just remember that the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 9, 7 said this. Each person must give as he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a, you guys know this? Cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. You know, uh, now, you know, pastors, we don't care if you're happy when you write the check or not. I'm just... Just being honest, okay? We're, we're transparent here. 
I don't care if you're like, oh, I hate doing this. But God loves a cheerful giver. Man, he's looking at us going, do you, are you excited about, you know, funding ministry? Are you excited about building the kingdom of God? I've given you this. How do you want to bless my kingdom? So that's our part. We can pray. All of us can pray. We can invite. All of us can invite. Most of us can serve. Most of us can give. But whatever you can do, here's the thing. I want everyone to help as we build a ministry of life change. You see, in a sense, the mission of Jesus is a group project. And I want us all to do our part. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we get to be part of your kingdom. We get to be part of your family. And, and we really couldn't do anything to save ourselves. It took all of the actions of Jesus to rescue us. It was all on him, and he gave everything so that we could be his children. And so, God, uh, right now, we just want to praise you for that. We want to thank you for that, and, and we want to celebrate that at the, in reality, but we also, God, just want to commit ourselves to doing our part, uh, to, to praying, to inviting, to serving, to giving. Uh, God, you are, are the one who made life eternal possible when we had no hope. And so we wanna celebrate the death and resurrection of our Savior, and we wanna give him all the praise, all the honor, all the glory, all the devotion, all the commitment. That's our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Nehemiah was burdened by the fallen, broken wall around Jerusalem, and he chose to do something about it. What is the Lord leading you to do? I encourage you to be asking God to impress upon you what he would have you to do. If you'd like to support the ministry of Calvary, I invite you to check our website out at calvaryaz.com. There you'll be able to learn more about upcoming events, follow us on our social media platforms, view or listen to past messages, and to give support financially. Thanks for joining us today. Have a wonderful week, and please come back for part five next weekend. Bye-bye. Are you looking for a way to dive deeper into scripture and make it a part of your daily routine? Check out Calvary's Word for the Day daily devotional videos. Visit calvaryaz.com forward slash D-E-V-O and sign up to receive these three to five minute devotionals right to your inbox each day. Our team of pastors and leaders share meaningful insights from the Bible to equip and encourage you in your faith journey. Don't miss out on this opportunity to grow in your relationship with God and connect with the community of believers. Sign up today and start receiving your daily dose of scripture.